we are going to be talking about all things herbs. I'm so excited. So my name is Joni Parsons. I'm co-creator of Revel 11, and I'm a huge gardener and a fan of everything nature, everything that grows, blossoms, smells. Um, <laughs> and here we are. It's almost summer, officially next week, and I thought it would be a really good time to talk about herbs. And um, I have planted more herbs this year than I have ever done before. Like I said, I had these beautiful herbs right outside my kitchen window. Um, I've also planted tarragon and sage and lemongrass and parsley and oregano and lavender and so much more. Why? It's because they're so beautiful and there's just so many uses from the kitchen. Like I was just brushing up against the lavender this morning and this beautiful fragrance just filled the garden. And then not to mention all of the medicinal uses as well. I am so thrilled to welcome back Sue Getz. It's so good to see you this morning. Sue and I met many, many years ago at the Northwest Flower and Garden Show, and we have remained friends since. And uh, Sue is not only an herb expert, but the owner of the Creative Gardener. Welcome, Sue. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm excited. I'm excited too. <laughs> My favorite topic um, at eight o'clock in the morning. I love it. Right. Um, so we were talking briefly about our love of gardening, our mutual love of gardening. And I would love for you to tell the story about how you originally started to love the garden. It goes way back. It goes way back. And I think it does for a lot of people. For me, it was when I was younger, um, trying to think of the age, but younger, and I would visit my grandma and grandpa on the coast of Oregon, that a big, beautiful garden, they grew everything. And my grandpa would go out and he would pick uh, romaine leaves, the big, long leaves, and he'd bring them in the kitchen and he'd shake off the dirt and then put salt and pepper and just start eating. And I remember sitting at the, the kitchen table going, you can snack out of the garden. How cool is that? You know, and just, and, and, and that continued, like I'd go pick uh, the berries in the garden. And, and it was just this like learning thing um, because my mom wasn't a gardener. My grandparents were, I learned that you could just, you could get things back from the garden. It wasn't just plants sitting there. You got goodies back, which was awesome. <laughs> Lots of goodies. Yeah. <laughs> I love walking through the garden and tasting things. And you you were mentioning how you give blueberries to the dogs. I'm like, <laughs> absolutely. I have my blueberries growing outside. Yeah. <laughs> um, tell us about herbs specifically. I think you've been a gardener for a long time and then you switched, I mean, added to um, your love of gardening with herbs. So tell us about that original nexus point. Yeah. So, you know, back in, back when I, I would garden because I actually lived on a, a, some property and was able to garden a lot, but the more I got into it, the more I was, I, I call myself a little bit of a selfish gardener. I'm like, what can that plant do for me? Right. <laughs> like, you know, like, so I started to just cultivate plants that I could get something from. And of course you start with food and, and I did that. I had flowers, but then there was this magical group of plants that had fragrance and I could make lotion. I could make tea. I could just pop out in the garden. And it was so simple just to go out in the garden, grab a leaf, make tea. This was just a moment of like, I want more of this. And so I just started delving in and exploring and learning from others and just most of my learning was by doing and, and trialing and trying and, and reading on studies and research and, and being absolutely taken, you know, full force, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> by all these plants that could totally give me something back. And even I'm, I'm incredibly fascinated by history as well of herbs and, and, you know, where, why they're called an herb, you know, and, and, and sometimes it's, you read a historical, uh, kind of recollection of using plants from the garden as medicine. And, and so I'm always like, Ooh, what was this used for? You know, what did they do with it? Cause some of it, of course we don't do today. It's kind of lost. It's, it's whatever in the world, or maybe safety issues, different things that happen in different world, the world of herbalism, but it's still absolutely fascinating to find it out. It really is. Yeah. You know, I've gone on a, um, 
some horticultural tours. And one of the, the first ones that I went on was in Costa Rica. And the very, the, the thing that really stood out to me at that point was walking through the forest and our guide telling us about all of the medicinal uses of, you know, everything on the forest floor and the flora and fauna. And, you know, we still have some people who do that, but we've really lost the magic of the connection. Is, would you yeah. say that's true? Oh, absolutely. And I love the mat, would you say the magic of connection just by walking through and, and that's what we need to keep. We keep preserving that knowledge and, and, you know, literally walking through the garden and show, oh, if you rub this, look what happens. And we'll talk about that in a little bit too, but it, it is, you know, what an enchanting walk to walk with someone through, you know, a forest and, and they'll say, oh, that tree we use for headache or we make tea out of this or it's or you use this for a bruise or you use yeah. this you know if you have right. a headache and right. and right I mean even walking through an urban garden like mine you know in Seattle there's so many uses in the garden that we just we don't even think about and that's why I wanted to have you on is I want to bring that element of magic you know of what's in our garden back to life. And so for all of us on here, let's, let's talk about some magic. So Sue is going to share, um, why don't you pull up the PowerPoint? Okay. We're going to talk um, through quite a few herbs today. And um, here we go. Is that working? Yes. So okay. one okay. of the things that I love is about the sensory part of the garden Talk to me about that. Like when you go out your garden, how does it feel to you? Like what, what do you, I mean, you have geranium here, you have mint, you have yes. roses, lavender. I, yeah, to me, it's, it's like this basket. I, I, when I was working through these photos, I thought, should I remove that picture? No, because it's just this <laughs> bounty. I mean, if, if we could have this show and smell moment virtually, you know, we're smelling mint and roses and all of these things. And, you know, when I talk about sensory and, and I'm going to kind of show some things through here, it's like, you know, I hear people all the time because my, my work is a garden designer and they say, oh, my garden is my therapy. It's very personal for people. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's like, so in that personal thing, the way that we connect personally is by sight and sit and, and taste and smell and all of those senses, because that's our body's physical way to kind of capture why we love going in the garden. Cause we know it feels good, but is it because of what we're smelling because of what we're seeing because of what we're tasting, touching it's all of that. And, and that's the part that's just fascinating to me. And, and I think as well, because they t it touches all of our senses, there, there's a sense of grounding yeah. and connection that we need so desperately in our, in our life because of, all, you know, not just life is crazy, but the world is crazy, but to walk out in the garden and to feel that sense of belonging and connection is probably the most powerful elements that we have close by to us. I agree. Absolutely. Because it is, like you said, that grounding, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you can walk through a garden, you can walk fast, you can walk slow. What slows you down is all of the things that are kind of coming at you. Right. And, and like, even, you know, if you were to walk through an herb garden, cause I just thought, oh, this photo, imagine yourself on this pathway oh, and your hand <laughs> is drifting across that lavender, right. As you're walking by, like it's the handrail and, and all of a sudden, you know, what happens when you touch herbs or when the sun hits them, all of their essential oils, that oil within the plant is released. And in the essential oil is the healing, the taste, all of that, that, that fragrance that you get. And so it's like aromatherapy. I mean, it, it's, it's a practice, uh, certainly aromatherapy is a practice, but in your garden, it could be your own personal natural practice just to walk through and drift your hand on, on a plant. And, and, and then it just, 
all of a sudden starts filling your senses. You smell it, you see it, because we're seeing this on the screen, obviously. And then you walk through and then all of a sudden it just starts mixing in. And when you smell lavender, what are the healing properties of lavender? So I, I actually have a little bit about that coming up. I'm going to oh, okay. dig deep into like five or six plants. And so, I mean, it, immediately just a walk through the nature of lavender is to calm and it actually has the ability to bring blood pressure down um, in its kind of therapeutic uses. So imagine in the garden, what it's doing. It's like bringing Amazing. your calming blood. Yeah. And, and, and I always just, I, I like people to, I like people as well as myself to be completely in awe of that every day. Right. I don't ever want to be jaded by the fact that lavender smells amazing on a summer day. Right. And so, you know, sometimes you just have to go out and go, oh, yeah, the roses in bloom, whatever that looks like. And so, you know, kind of when we bring it kind of all into the garden and, and here's another again, just rub your I mean, lavender season is coming. I'm so excited. <laughs> it is. I know mine are just like they're. I wanted to just to cut a little bit to have them here today, but they're not even, there's no purple showing yet, but they're coming. <laughs> so close, so close. So and I have close. some other pictures because I, I love, you know, being, uh, being virtually right now and sharing with people all over, it's like, I, I want some in your face moments, right? And so it's like, <laughs> what's in your face? And so really, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that walk through the garden, right? You know, how you interact with fragrant plants. And then I'm going to touch on some of those herbs, but really when you're walking, when you're thinking about your garden and it's like, okay, I'm doing herbs. Sue talked me into this, right? <laughs> and then, um, but it's like, where are they the most valuable? It's like when you're walking to the front door, that's where my lavender hedge is. I want people to experience that when they come to the door or the roses that are clinging right onto the railing, you know, right by the front door. Um, if you just have the, the luxury of just a patio or a roof garden, then where's those planted herbs you know where are they you want to smell them you want to you know it's like how can we just you know and it isn't just like one lavender it's a whole bunch and it's like masses and and just really infusing everything so that you can put them where they're the most beneficial if it's out in the back 40 where you store your garbage cans that's just no fun no <laughs> you know it's like it needs to be a little bit further in and so um so just to share uh, um about kind of you know looking in the garden and and you know like what we see in the garden of course is color and there's that there's one of the purple basils you held that one up Purple yep. ruffles, yeah. And and then this one here in the photo I have is, is called amethyst. But look how gorgeous, gorgeous that is. Gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. So you get color, your eye is just like your, you know, the sight is so enchanted by that color. Every time I see a purple basil, I'm just like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I actually bought some the other day and I don't need more, but I do. <laughs> you know? I think so I'm gonna go to the um gardening store today and get yeah. some more. <laughs> right. Look for it because I, I poke this in containers because it looks so gorgeous. And, and again, like I said, it's like poking in color into a container garden, but then you get flavor. You could go out and nip the leaves and throw that on a salad or whatever. And, yeah, and, and so, so you yeah, don't have ahead. to have just an herb container either. I mean, you can throw, you know, the throw, you can plant yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and nurture, you know, various herbs within you know, a, a flower container, which I think most people don't think of necessarily, but yeah. it's such a nice addition. Yeah. Like you could see this rosemary in this gorgeous piece of pottery. I, I mean, why not? You know, yeah. instead of, herbs don't have to be in their little proper, you know, herb garden. They can be tucked in with ornamentals. They just wear, you know, sometimes space is your luxury. And so you have to just kind of find it because it's a commodity. Like, oh, I can only do a beautiful pot. Well, I need a, a fragrant plant in it. Why not? You know, this gorgeous rosemary tip, tipping out or, or whatever that looks like. It's, it's just really pulling you in by the site. And then you get the rest of the story, which is all the fragrance and everything else. And then this one, just, I had to put this, it's like, 
this was taken up in Squam a few years ago and I just uh, sitting under the rose arbor and it, come on, this is like therapy. It's so all gorgeous. <laughs> it is. And I had to put a close up like, and that's what that purple is, is, is that beautiful lavender. And then of course the ladybug posing very kindly for, for me while I'm taking the photo, but you can see this is your, your sight when that sense is grabbed um, so quickly, same here, time and uh, cat mint with roses and it's just like all you know this this crazy that that your eyes have to see because that's what lures you and then once you're kind of lured in then it's like what's the sound and to me the sound of herbs it isn't what you think it is it's it's bees buzzing right it's how do we attract that sound of nature and birds and bees fluttering and and because really what herbs do is they're, you know, with all their shapes, their colors, they offer nectar and aromatics and all the things that bring pollinators in. And we're having lots of conversation about pollinator gardens. And if you Google, you know, pollinator garden plants, herbs almost always top the list somewhere because they're uh, pulling you in. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I've been doing, um, I borrowed some property from my neighbors, <laughs> because I ran out of space in my own urban garden and I'm doing a little pollinator garden containers that are four foot by eight foot three of them oh, nice. so I'm I'm mixing pollinator plants with um with herbs and for the pure reason of of drawing in pollinators and yesterday I could not have been more pleased I came home and there was two beautiful butterflies and a hummingbird in my right in my garden in my front yard I'm like okay I'm yeah. doing the right thing it yeah. felt so good to me I just had to share that because I'm I, I'm I'm dedicated to bringing back the pollinators in our you know in here in Ballard in Seattle. yeah agreed and we all should be feeling that way that. we yeah. all should just be uh, enchanted and when every time I yeah. I never get tired of watching bees and butterflies and all of that good stuff. And I even have a little tease of like, if you don't have that acre of lavender or whatever, um, you know, it's, it's like, can you, oops, there we go. There's this is a little container of herbs for, for pollinators. This is how simple it could be. Some echinacea, you know, some oregano, uh, cat mint, which is fabulous. And, you know, this pollinator garden, you could totally stick right outside the window or next to your veg garden or wherever you want that activity to happen. And you could do it like on hummingbirds, same thing, right? Oh, Bring, that's gorgeous. Yeah. And just, I mean, imagine this sitting outside a window where you sit and have your morning tea and you're watching the hummingbirds just kind of do their thing all over it or by, you know, if people hang feeders and there's nothing near the feeders for them to also get natural nectar or you know, whatever out of, then it's a shame. So by your feeder, put this container, if you can't plant something nearby or put the feeder in the container <laughs> for all that matters too. Yeah. Let's talk about, so this is your book here, the complete container herb garden, yeah. which is fabulous. I have it. And, <laughs> but let's talk about each of these different things that you have in the hummingbird garden. So yeah. Yeah. Would you talk about those? Yeah. So what, you know, what the target is on these is, you know, we always think of red. It doesn't have to be red because in studies, it shows that um, hummingbirds are drawn in by the color red, but it's not their preference. Their preference is plants that give them nectar. And, and so, you know, they'll go to something that's not red if it gives them the juice they want, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> and so like anise hyssop, which is also known as hummingbird mint, and bee balm, uh, you know, which is Monarda. So bee balm, you can see the little purple puffs on the larger uh, urn, that's bee balm. And then mints all day long, I let those bloom and the hummingbirds just go mad for them because there's a lot of nectar in those. What a lot of these um, also have is, you know, hummingbirds have to, you know, kind of get into the flower. So tubular flowers really make a big difference where they can grab nectar. And so all of these things, just these have loads of, of food for them as far as the nectar goes and energy. So then, and they're also highly fragrant. So there's that part too. And that draws them in. They The, the fragrance in the sun draws in the hummingbirds. And so you can, you know, build a container and just set it wherever you need to, to enjoy the show. 
I love that. And, and is it true, like with this hummingbird feeder that you have here, that it's best to have that style with, with the little bud on the, on the side? Yeah, you know, a lot of times it, it is because it's mimicking that tubular shape of the flower. That's okay. what we're trying to That's look what at, it is. right? Okay. Yeah, and and so mimicking that and and still making the liquid accessible, and also ways to kind of keep other predators, you know, out of it. And I say predators, that sounds pretty uh, lurid, but it, it's like also you know ants and things like that getting into it because they're drawn to the sweetness. And so if we make it more like a flower, I mean, we do want them. We don't want the the hummingbird doesn't know that it's a plastic flower. It looks like a flower, so it's going to come yeah. get nectar, right? And so we want it to look kind of natural to that and be able to get into the flower. Okay, I just learned that because there's so many gla pretty glass ones that just have the little you know, the little hook down at the bottom. And, and I was told that that wasn't the best. So that's good to know. Yeah. Um, so a question from Kathleen, danger of spreading disease to hummingbirds through feeders? So that's, it, it's all, all, all about cleanliness of the feeder. A lot of people just like fill them, hang them, off they go. But if there's a sugary sweet liquid in there, then that sugary sweet liquid has um, really the likelihood that it's going to go moldy or start to create some sort of science experiment inside, because that's just the nature of the biology of sugar water. And so being able to get those feeders clean, so cleaning them on a regular basis and making sure that those little flowers uh, don't get plugged up with ants or or whatever. It's it's all about the cleanliness. That helps the the disease issue because it's spread through the liquid that they're drinking. And and if you you know if you're not if it's not in a place where you can keep it clean or or whatever that looks like, then you then you shouldn't have a feeder. You should have more plants. <laughs> um, yeah. And you know. then um and then Sue, just a quick question. Um, as far as the formula for the sugar water, is it a quarter cup to one cup? of water I, do you remember i do not remember but i know it's a pretty low ratio because it just needs to have just enough sweetness and mm -hmm. and we don't need the red dye and all that crazy no. stuff in there because that's again, nobody needs red dye I'll nobody needs that. red dye in their life <laughs> i agree with you especially when we're feeding it to these really tiny little, tiny birdies. little birdies yeah yeah, yeah. um again because they're not really their preference isn't red. Their, their preference is the sweet juice. And, and so, you know, you don't have to put anything red in it, but again, it's just cleanliness. Make sure those feeders are staying clean. Don't just leave them hanging out there all the time. Okay. And just one more question about this. I also heard that you should boil the sugar water first and let it cool down, then put it in. So the boiling really, and this is what I understand is the boiling is just to break down the sugar. So mm -hmm. that it becomes a more bit. like a syrup instead of the granular parts of the sugar in there. So that's yeah. what the boiling process is all okay. about. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now we know. It. Let's draw in all the hummingbirds we possibly can. I know. I'll, uh, yeah, because you've got this <laughs> one banquet of herbs that can do that. It's like, you know, I'd want to, I, every morning I have a, a rosemary hedge out front and, and almost every morning without fail, there's hummingbirds on it. They just absolutely all year because it blooms, you know, different times of the year, especially in the winter. And, and so what can you do to kind of make that more available to, to the, to the birds and bees? So, yeah, so that's the sound, you know, hearing them buzz by and. And, and Sue, there was a question in the chat about, so what does your garden look like in the fall or winter, but you plant for year round um, pollination yeah. and it, it's not just, we're not just thinking about spring and summer here. We're thinking all year round. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, thinking about, um, herbs like in my area. So it depends on where you live too. It, you know, rosemary is an evergreen. It's beautiful year round. And that is feeding the hummingbirds year round. And, and so looking at plants that don't always die down herbaceous, uh, rosemary, sage, uh, you know, lavender doesn't, it, it doesn't die all the way back. Uh, the, the leaves still are on the plant, still fragrant. Um, it's obviously the flower that's attractive, but um, I'm a huge proponent of, you know, making sure your garden is year round as your seasons will allow it to be. Uh, because 
boy, what a, what a shame not to have it. Yeah, like, what a waste. I mean, I've made sure that I have like sarcococca and a, and a, you know, exactly. a full on uh, winter garden so that I'm drawing things in year round and yeah. also to have the fragrance year round as well. The fragrance. Yeah. Every, again, everything that kind of pulled that sensory connection and, mm -hmm. you know, even in design, if I see a garden that's like abundant in the summer, but kind of eh, in the winter and fall, I, usually encourage people just go to the garden store in a different season. So where your garden isn't the most abundant, go shopping in November, or December, because then you'll see the witch hazels and the camellias and, you know, things like that, that bloom in the winter. And so then you can have a, a, a more year round garden. And, and, and so there's different ways to kind of achieve that just by shopping in a different season, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll just kick on to the next yeah. step, which is the yep. easy one. This is the one we all know, right? Taste. Um, and this one is just whatever you can grab and taste. This is, you know, my favorite part. And I think the way I look at taste in the garden and herbs specifically is uh, it's a bit of a gateway into learning more about herbs. You, you, you know, you buy a basil and you're like, that's cool. And I have a little bit more as we go on it. I have all the magic that basil can create beyond just spaghetti sauce, <laughs> you know, and, Excellent. and I can't wait. Yeah. And, and, you know, like everything that you can about tasting. And I um, always encourage people to, to really just, if you're not sure how you're going to cook with a plant, um, an herb in particular, obviously um, taste the leaf, just start there, you know, taste the leaf and go, oh, that's pretty good. Like if you tasted tarragon, you're like, that's cool. That's licorice. And what would I use that in? And maybe I'll start and put it in some salad, you know, parsley, same thing. Maybe I'll sprinkle salad or parsley on the top of my uh, power bowl or something just to add, you know, just to add that kind of moment. And that's how you start to figure out how to use them beyond recipes. I'm not a recipe follower. It's, it, but I, I need to be, <laughs> but sometimes <laughs> I'm just like, I'm going to throw this on and see what happens. And when you're talking about the flavor and things, and here's another container garden is, is really just um, the flavor of plants that are powerful, then you're going to start to go, oh, that's pretty strong. Like rosemary is really strong. And, and so you're not, you're going to use it kind of lightly, right? You're going to use it. Um, and fennel is very delicate. It's very licorice, but very delicate. So you can, you can use that with a heavier hand to season. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the way you start to balance yourself to experiment a little bit. Um, and so this was just a, um, just a nod to, to a trip to Provence where, you know, all of these beautiful Mediterranean herbs and you can put them all in a container and go wild and just absolutely. And this is just a feast right there. Um, well, so and the fennel is the you know, beautiful bronze fennel is just yes. so gorgeous with that, with the purple color next to it and the rosemary. Yep. Yeah. That's and that's that kind of statement in the pot, that big billow of soft that you could put in a container garden it looks amazing and and i think that's you know one way to just stick but but experimenting with the flavors that's a big deal because you you might go okay the recipe called for a teaspoon of oregano well go out in the garden and taste a leaf of oregano right because oregano to me is very subjective to taste you'll become a an herb snob about it. You're like, oh, I only use Greek oregano in cooking yep. <laughs> you know? because it's very, I mean, Greek oregano is very bite and powerful, whereas a common oregano doesn't have as much of that bite to it. And, you know, Italian parsley is compared to curly parsley. So it's just like, what is your, what is your adventure in tasting first and then using them in recipes? I love the adventure part of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's the fun part for sure. That's the fun part. That's the fun <laughs> part. Yeah. Um, and, you know, then of course, touch, touch is easy to me. It's when you touch things, that's when herbs release their magic. A lot of times you walk by and go, that's pretty, but you don't really smell it. But you have to do that almost with mint. It's very unusual. You smell it until you break the oil glands on it. And breaking the oil glands means you're rubbing your hand on it. And basil, same thing. And, and so, you know, what is touch in the garden and how, and touch to me is like where you can interact with it as much as anything. And that's what we're looking for is how we touch ourselves uh, with the connect on the pathway in a container 
right? I mean, if you go out in the garden and you have a chair where you sit and you read a book in the afternoon because it's shady and there there should be an herb garden nearby. <laughs> yes, be. absolutely. Yeah. So, so a couple <laughs> so so a couple of questions in the chat. Um, somebody yeah. doesn't get a lot of sun. But I know that there are, I just actually did some research on this for a friend. He doesn't get very much sun on his deck either. And so um, there's there are four or five herbs that um, are low sun lovers. Um, it was chives, mm -hmm. um, oregano, thyme, and there is one other. But anyway, yeah. there's quite, do you have any others for low yeah. light? You know, mint is pretty forgiving as well for light. And so you can grow mint in shadier conditions. Um, and what I have sneaking around in the shade of, of some of my garden is uh, sweet woodruff, which is one I, I oh, don't talk about too much, but it has that wonderful vanilla-like aroma and you can make a tea with the leaves. Beautiful little thing. It loves the shade. So it's a nice little ground cover. And uh, so mint and, and and chives, you're right on that one because chives will just grow wherever they grow because they're, fam they're famous for that. <laughs> but mint is a good one. You can experiment with different mints too. It doesn't need a full sun condition. Yeah. And um, I just did some research online uh, about that. And there, there were like five or six that really thrive in that area. A lot of those um, spread a lot. So you just need to be mindful of, of what you put together, which goes into the next question about, is there anything that we shouldn't plant together? Um, you know, there isn't necessarily an issue with like a symbiotic relationship, like one thing won't grow because another one's nearby. It truly is what you just said. It's about how they spread around. And so yeah. aggressive herbs, herbs in the mint family, which are the square stems. So mint, oregano, um, try to think of some other spreaders, uh, lemon balm, notorious. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> notorious. notorious. So, so what I do with those spreaders, um, I always say they come with a disclaimer. They will spread around the garden if you don't be careful. And you want to just either plant them in their own pot so that they, you know, can behave themselves there. Or if they're going out in the garden, like sweet woodruff does spread around, it's easy to get, but mint is not easy to control. And neither is oregano if it takes off on you. And so really just, you know, you either got to be there with a shovel showing it who's boss once in a while in the garden or put it in a container, right? So that you can um, kind of keep ahead of it and not let it get out, out of control. And I just actually thought of another shade. <laughs> I mean, my brain was like still in the shade mode. So marjoram is really a nice one in the shade. And that's that kind of sweeter form of oregano. Um, that's a really pretty one too. That's a great tip. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, just a couple more ways to touch. I, I, you know, this was a garden I came across when I was visiting a place in Idaho and I thought a labyrinth, there's a touch point in the lawn surrounded by a garden of herbs. How cool is that? It's like, what a great that's combination really cool. that was. And it's like, I want to do this. Well, I don't have a lawn anymore. I took all that out, but if you can't get rid of your lawn, you can certainly embed a labyrinth in it. Can't you? <laughs> I think that would pass an HOA somewhere, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I would hope so. Um, but, you know, it's that touch point. And again, making plants like this is just a little garden plan. And, and and you know, just being able to walk in and grab and touch and interact and not just put them all together where you can't get to them and kind of work through the jungle, right? We want to be able to kind of step in and, and interact with things. And these are just little 12 by 12 square, you know, pavers, oh. you could get at just where whatever, you know, your fam favorite home improvement store is. And so then you, you're able to step between everything, right. And go back to get that rosemary in the back. And, and you can see lemon balm is potted in this. <laughs> because... Yes. I, I noticed that in the mint. <laughs> and the mint. Yeah. It's like, so... you guys are in pots. So you behave yourselves. You need to behave. Yeah. What was, the shade, what was the shade plant you last mentioned? I didn't hear you. Marjoram? Marjoram. Marjoram. Okay. Yeah. Marjoram. And I love, it's a sweet, sweeter form of oregano. That one I actually prefer over using oregano. It's a beautiful little plant. And then um, let's see. So I then smell. That's the big one, right? <laughs> this is the one. Yeah. There's that basket again. But, uh, you know, and here's just another idea. The reason I kind of wanted these watercolor sketches in here is is this just shares with everybody, you don't have to have an acre. You can have a rooftop, right? And you can have perfume. And that's that's really, you know, you could have whatever the size and space you 
have the ability to garden um, or the space to garden, you can't set yourself with a limitation. If you have an acre grow lavender, go for it or basil, go for it. But if you don't, you know, here's a, a beautiful little pottery with thyme and heliotrope, which is a wonderful fragrance and lavender, little dwarf lavender and some roses. I'm experimenting with roses right now in containers to see the best one. So um, I have a blog, stay tuned. <laughs> I'll see what it shows oh, up. Good. I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, we'll see what shows that. up. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, containers, but also here's another little kind of a, a sketch of just some different plants. And um, so these designs too, there's a little blip you can see at the bottom. I don't know, on some screens it may not show up, but these are um, in the process of going into my shop. And so if you put in the code REBEL11, you would get a discount off of them. And some of them would be free actually. And so you can get these garden designs, but this one is more, again, if you're going to build up an aromatherapy garden, a garden full of fragrance, then you better darn well put a bench in there because you gotta, yes, go, in, definitely. <laughs> you gotta go in and grab and, and and be around it and and it's all about that kind of moment of of interaction right how we interact with the the space instead of just oh that's pretty and, and planted um we want it to be pretty and planted but we want it to be an interactive space because most of these don't release naturally uh you know or a real heavy, I would say in the sun, roses do, lavender does, but you've got to coax some, some fragrances out. Like, you know, you said you were growing lemongrass and lemon verbena is another, and you've got to rub those leaves to get those to smell. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, we want to kind of walk by them and, 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 you know, and it's really that kind of touch point of, of, you know, how we kind of break the leaves and get all the fragrance on our hands and things like that. So someone asked in the chat, Sue, about the most fragrant rose, and you had the Gertrude Jekyll one um, listed in that design. Is that one of yeah. the most fragrant? So that's a great question. And I'm going to say, um, coming up in about three or four slides, I have a whole list of my favorite fragrance. Oh, do you? Okay. I Look do. So nice well, opportunity this... coming up. <laughs> okay. Well, let's yeah. go. Yeah, so, so what I wanted to do next is I'm going to just blip through some some herbs and, and really dial them in just a little bit with their attributes. But also, you know, what I say is you'll know, everybody will know all of these. They're not really necessarily um, some exotics because I like to start with these really like, okay, we're, we're doing these. These I can find, I can grow, they're easy. Um, but it's like, I, I like to say, if, if you know about this plant, maybe you're going to learn something new about it. Like, you know, something new, you learned about an old friend or something like when you use basil, right? You know that it's, it's you make pesto and, and it's edible, but, and it's a very much a seasoning plant. And you can see all the colors here in, in the container, that purple basil again, I can't get enough of that purple right now. <laughs> it's just really beautiful. And it makes a beautiful vinegar. If you use a basil, a purple basil in a, in a vinegar, it turns it kind of pink and it's really pretty. And so, you know, knowing about this, but a lot of people don't know what a great healer basil is. And so in, in the aromatherapy practices, it's used actually as, as more of an antidepressant. It will uplift your mood. And, and so it's very warming and you feel very calmed and restored by it. And so, for you, instead of if, if you, you know, don't necessarily have basil oil, you're not an aromatherapy studio to do this, you could go out in your garden and you can pick basil and make a cup of tea and put those leaves in there. And then as you're drinking that tea, that infusion is, is wafting in your nose, wow. it's pulling you in and then sipping that hot tea. Um, and it says, you know, of course it's good for digestion, but even just good for your soul. <laughs> you know, just because it's, it, it is a bit of a super healer. And, and, and I think people kind of forget that it's also very soothing to skin. So if you went and made that basil tea and you let it um, simmer down to cooler, so it's not hot, you could use it on skin and kind of calm down like a rash or irritation or summer and bug bites, kind of things that are stinging, not open wounds. Cause basil is also very calming to skin. And you smell a little bit like spaghetti, but that's okay. <laughs> it smells really good. <laughs> it smells really and then, good. Yeah, there's that purple ruffles. That's that one you were showing, I think, is 
Um, and, and so these are some other, I just wanted to show the other way that kind of basil hits you is, is with the colors and the site. And so you don't have to just, I, I tend to grow just those beautiful Italian Genovese and those types, because that's my favorite, uh, for cooking. And that's what I tend to use them more for, but, you know, you can gather the Thai basils, which are those ones with, you know, that you can see in the, in the center photo, those are have a little more clove in them, a little more camphor. Mm -hmm. So they have a little different aroma, different different flavor, but they're also um, well, well studied for their healing qualities. Um, and so a, a cup of Thai basil tea is just mesmerizing to your senses. And then- I'm gonna do that today. So quick yeah. question, is sure. African blue basil edible? So yeah, and that's the one that you see um, that so the I, African blue is is um, absolutely edible. What I love about that it is more in the Thai basil family, so it has a little more clove like so it isn't that kind of Italian classic basil uh, fragrance or flavor, but it is edible, so it'll kind of spice up more um, exotic dishes. What I love about that one in particular is. So most of the time when you grow basil, you have to pinch off the blooms, right? Because you want it to continue leaf production and not go to flower. But um, African blue, and there's another one that's very similar called Magic Mountain, they continue to bloom and produce leaves well. So you can use it more decoratively in a container um, because it, it kind of will continue its production. Whereas other basils, if they go to flower, it's their signal to stop leaf production. And you have to kind of pinch those off to make sure you're getting lots of leaves and things like that. And then flavor, of course, um, you know, with I basil doesn't dry well. And so I freeze basil if I want to preserve it. So if we're getting to the end of the season, basil's kind of needing to be harvested. Um, what you can do is put it in a food processor and just pulse it lightly. You don't want it to turn it into complete mush and add a little bit of olive oil and then put those into um, ice cube trays and freeze them. And so then you have winter basil where you could just pop that out of the freezer and saute with it um, or let it melt down into a soup or something. So you've captured all of that essence into that. Um, so that's just a, a flavor tip because it's hard to preserve it in dry. Um, and so basil, lots of magic, but lavender. Okay, Here it is. Quick, quick oh, question yeah, from ahead. the chat. Sure. Um, one, one um, Mary Lou said she was, um, her basil was getting eaten alive. Do you recommend meme oil? Um, I, I, my first line of attack and eaten alive, I assume by maybe slugs or aphids or bugs. something. What's that? She said night bugs. Oh, so um, I, I try to keep ahead of it and give them a good shot with a hose and rinse. And, and I know that's not going to help for night feeding beetles and things like that, but I try to avoid, you can use neem oil, but that's something I would avoid because all of the glands on basil are so close right into the leaves um, that you're kind of affecting that pretty quickly. And so it's, it's a desperation <laughs> before you use something on it. If you can uh, wash it off with a good, you know, kind of soap or a good spray of water, good hit of water, and maybe put them where they're a little more protected, get them in a pot, get them above, you know, ground, whatever that might look like. That's helpful. Um, I, and I think it's just hyper diligent to be, um, you know, because that's a crop you're going to want to save, but you don't want to really treat it with too much. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. So lavender, I mean, this is like, it gets like everything. It's like the Swiss army knife of everything. It, you can use it in design. It's drought tolerant, deer resistant. Pollinators go crazy. Uh, the flowers are edible. You make lavender lemonade, things like that. Aromatherapy, but in its aromatherapy, um, and it, it's very healing and very calming. And also it's well, well studied that it's great for burns and things like that. And so, um, you know, lavender is just magic. And I just thought I'd throw out these because I think if you went in the garden store right now, you'd go, what? There's so many different kinds. Different I don't know what kinds. to choose, right? So the Spanish lavender, which is the one with the little kind of flurry butterfly kind of flower on it, that I call the landscaper's lavender. That's not what you're using for healing. It's not what you're using for cooking. 
it's just really a great bloomer in the landscape. And so it gives you that waft of purple. Whereas those true English lavenders, those are the ones that you're using for healing and cooking and um, all of the things that we're talking about, the nurturing qualities. And that's the one that's just now going to start to come into bloom. And so, um, you know, you'll see, and I wanted a close up so you could see some of the beautiful flower heads um, that are popping up and it, and and there's really great research that the pure essence of lavender forces your body to make a physical response. So it, it lowers your blood pressure and it, and it lowers skin temperature, which means if you were to go out in the garden and you like you've been, let's say you've been gardening a little too hard and you're out in the sun <laughs> and you need to kind of calm a, a lavender water would do that or just walking through the garden, rubbing that oil on your hands from the flowers and pulling that and just kind of warming, you know, kind of bring, yeah, right. Pulling that in, uh, that will help bring your body temperature down, which is, is quite amazing. Um, in fact, um, that's me standing in a field in Provence last year and talk about aromatherapy because <laughs> it was so <laughs> that looks hot. amazing. It was like, it was in the nineties <laughs> and all of the essence there were so many bees, you can kind of see them in the photo. They were just everywhere, but they were happy. I was happy. And it was this aromatherapy moment. And that's just, all it was, was walking through a plant. We can do that in our garden. You know, mm -hmm. we could have just that walk through moment um, in the garden and it would be amazing. And, and if there's anybody locally that I'm doing a workshop at a nursery and on Saturday, July 22nd, we're going to make some goodies. So there's a little blip about that. If you're local and want to pop in and um, join the lavender festivity. <laughs> That's what we'll Fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm excited to do that. Cause I, I, I mean, it, I can talk about lavender a lot and, you know, show all kinds of yummy things, but, um, until you actually kind of smell it and just kind of in, you know, work your way through it. Um, and we're talking about the fresh flowers, the dried flowers, there's just every moment that you can use these plants. They're amazing. Um, and, and where are you, Sue? What's that? Where are you geographically? I am in Washington. Washington. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. State of Washington. Yeah. So, so my dear California friends that are here today, I'm so sorry, <laughs> but hopefully you're going to find your, I mean, there's lots of lavender everywhere. Mm -hmm. So hopefully someone locally is having a festival coming up. Most, most of the time in July, these farms are opening up and, and, you know, we, you know, we get to walk through them and pick and and actually and what, one thing I wanted to show in this larger picture was um this beautiful lavender that was dried and it was at, out of Provence and then it says um to not touch the flowers <laughs> like, well, <laughs> yeah. wait a minute that's what right. we're supposed that's to do right. but the reason is, is it's just a reminder that when they're dry they shatter just miserably crazy so if you were to touch that it would just all be all over the ground and nobody would buy it and so I, I thought that was interesting <laughs> <laughs> like don't touch, but look how pretty they are. <laughs> they are. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I could just, I could just wax on about lavender because it's just so many different things. And one of the things that also in the essential oil use on your hands, when you're rubbing flowers or whatever, is it's one of the essential oils that's not harmful to skin. You have to be careful to your own skin sensitivity wise, mm -hmm. but it's one of the few that you could use almost straight and it doesn't burn like a lot of oils do. And, and so that's kind of interesting if you had a bug bite and you, I mean, even if you took some lavender flowers that were fresh and you had a, a bee sting or something, crush it in your hand, rub that on there and hold it. And that oil will start to do its magic in there. Um, so it doesn't harm. That is, a good, that is definitely a good tip. Thank yeah. you. And so, so we, we have about 10 minutes left. Just okay, so, you so I probably should time. run through really quickly because um, I do have a couple more herbs I want to get. So mint, of course, we talked a lot about that. Um, and it's, it, what mint does is it, it brings surf, blood to the surface of the skin. It's a stimulant. That's why when you use a mint shampoo, your head feels like, whoa amazing and so here's what I want you to do is the next time next time you walk out in the garden and you're near a peppermint plant and you do this in the afternoon if you've been at your desk all day right and you're just like I'm exhausted I'm tired do I need coffee what do I need no you need to go out in the garden <laughs> and or have it right here <laughs> exactly and you run your hands up the plant until your hands are kind of full of fragrance and then cup your hands over your nose and then breathe in for a count of four and then breathe out and then do it again and 
And so if you continue this a few times, it's magic. You're all wow. of a sudden you're uplifted. You feel revived. It's freshening. It's cooling. It does so much that it's, 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 and it's that easy, right? To go out in the garden. Wow. It does. It does give you a boost. Yeah. And it's just, just, and that's how simple it is, right? Not, we didn't need to go get some fancy boiling beakers in the basement thing. We just go, (laughs) you know, we rub up a leaf and there you go. And so, you know, using it in, um, I freeze mint and ice cubes. So I can put that in my water bottle as I'm heading out for the day, um, just to kind of fresh, I use mint and smoothies. Um, I'll go through this fast. That's there's recipes for that on my blog that you can get on making different kinds of smoothies with herbs. And then roses. Um, I don't know about where everyone is right now, but roses this year have been absolutely phenomenal in the Pacific Northwest. Pacific Northwest. I feel like I'm constantly picking and and gathering roses for rose water because I make a ton of it this time of year. Just because I I gotta have it. I gotta have it. And so you know I, we talked about those kind of fragrant roses. And so the essential oil. Um, the rose has to be fragrant or it doesn't have the essence of the plant. It doesn't have the healing, doesn't have the softening. It doesn't have everything that you need. And so you need to make sure that it's an absolutely a fragrant rose. And so I'm always chasing after the most fragrant roses I can find. And um, because otherwise I'm not getting what I want out of it. And it doesn't give up readily, as you can see, Um, if you go buy rose oil, actual essential oil in the It's very expensive uh, because it just takes a lot to get a little bit out of it. And so if you can grow those petals and make rose waters and things like that. Um, So here's those fragrant roses. Um, This is a list of some that are super fragrant. And also the thing that I I need a balance on is that they're disease resistant because we don't want to be treating roses that we're eating or using on our skin whatever that looks like. So Ragosa Hansa is one of my favorites and it is absolutely going mad right now in the garden. It's just, and it produces a lot through the summer. And then Alchemist is one out by my front door and it's been just heavenly this year. And it's one of the multi-petals. So look at all those petals you get off of Alchemist. Yeah. I have to say, I like the name Sexy Rexy. (laughs) Sexy Rexy is, yeah. Yeah. It's like, and so then you get another <laughs> sensory moment, like, well, you're kind of sexy, Rexy. That's awesome. You're going in my garden. <laughs> yeah. But it's just like that disease resistance is powerful because we want the fragrance. I have Gertrude Jekyll. I did try Princess Anne in a container last year, and I'm really happy with it. So that's going on a blog, but there's a blog post called the Herbal Rosarian. And I list about a bunch of other ones that I'm, I've trialed. I like them. Uh, I'm looking for that. I, I, I don't care that they're the perfect little rosebud in, on the plant. I care that they're producing a lot of flowers with a lot of fragrance mm-hmm. and that I cannot have to treat for black spots and bugs and that kind of thing. And, and you know, if, if they get it, it's incidental. I can pick it off and, and do that with it. And then just a quick thing on, on um, they're also the protectors of my garden. Um, this is two photos Gertrude Jekyll surrounded by sage. And then the other rose, which I can't even remember because it's gone. <laughs> Cause it, but the deer, these are, these roses are five feet apart in my garden. The roses, wow. the deer absolutely annihilate that one, but they don't touch the Gertrude Jekyll. And they also don't touch my alchemist rose because I have surrounded them with herbs. So they're my protectors, right? So this one is, so the, the Gertrude Jekyll is with beer garden sage. And my alchemist is surrounded by catmint, nepeta. And I have deer eating everything else, but they won't touch what the herbs are surrounding. So that's why I call them my protectors. And that then, is a um, fabulous tip. Yeah, <laughs> and it works really well. So this is the rose water and this is um, on the blog too. So um, I was gonna flip through this real fast, but this is what I'm doing. Every time I'm getting fresh rose petals, I'm throwing them in water. Every couple of weeks, they're ready to strain out. And then I get this aromatic water that you could use like as a mist you know, on your skin, you could use it um, in cooking, throw it in a tea, uh, kind of add a little essence of rose. It's really the essence. It doesn't have this intense flavor, but it's very much got an essence to it. Um, And rosemary, another powerful one. Uh, And, you know, like I said, you know, these plants, but 
it's it's like their power that I wanted us to share because that's what we're talking about that sensory power imagine sitting on this bench and rubbing your head right <laughs> it's like okay I'm good <laughs> it's just so it's Be just lovely. a wonderful healer and um and it's you know it's anti-inflammatory antioxidant antifungal and those really are not the sexy parts of laugh of rosemary you know all those anti 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 but it also is um, very much a calmer, which doesn't doesn't really kind of allude to what you think, but it helps to bring um, blood pressure down a lot like lavender does. And anxiety, it's being used for memory, has been for years. Um, and so there's lots to think about in it as the healer. And, it, and you know, it's, and then of course the intensity, um, it's one of those flavors that's so intense. It has to go into like red sauces and beef and really these powerful things. You don't usually use it um, on lighter meals because it's so strong and so powerful. And then time, and I know I'm going fast, but <laughs> this is speed dating for herbs, right? <laughs> And we so, might have to do another one. Yeah, right. I know. It's just like, oh, we just, there's so much to talk about. So the time is the last one I'll talk about. Um, and again, the reason I wanted this is there's so much power in a time and using it where you on a footpath where you can release the aroma, using it for cooking, you know, all of those things. Look at these ways that you walk by it or step on it and release that aromatherapy into the garden. Um, this one is pink chintz, the larger one in the square stones. And then the one that's kind of eating the rocks over there is woolly thyme. Um, and, and so, you know, imagine going up those stairs, you get this dose of aromatherapy. I just love woolly thyme. I just want to go lay in it. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's so soft and beautiful. And then it just lets you walk on it barefoot and then mm -hmm. your feet get the aromatherapy as well. So you just kind of keep, I mean, all these different ways that the garden is, is going to help you interact and, and. So like when I'm cooking, the variegated lemon is my favorite, absolutely my favorite, um, so because it's, it's just so, it's so pretty and so powerful, um, but it's not as, it doesn't have as much menthol in it, like some of the other times. And so it doesn't kind of disturb food as much. That's why I like it. Whereas you get into some of the other ones, you know, like silver posy and, and, and these are ones like for housekeeping, you can make a thyme water, a rosemary water, and, and put those two together in a water and use that to clean countertops. Um, you know, soft scrub cleanser, you could actually mix it with borax, make a paste and scrub your, and so you're, you're kind of gathering those antioxidants and all of those things. And so really it's just to me, um, and I'll, I'll wrap up, I have one more slide and then we're, we can um, get on with our quick, quick day is, is just how you connect yourself. And we talked about that way early on, like mm -hmm. how do you interact? These are not just plants you're going to just kind of throw in the garden and go, that's pretty. These are plants you're going to want to walk by and, and pick and harvest and, and all those things. And, and it's like, uh, if you, you know, get frustrated, <laughs> um, <laughs> you could just go rub some herbs. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Um, you know, I always say just put some lavender, dried lavender sachet in your car. And when traffic's really crazy, I mean, just start squeezing that thing as like much that. as you can, right? Same with the rosemary. Rosemary brings the pulse down. It helps you to calm down. And so it's like, that's what the garden does for you. <laughs> that's as easy as it is. Um, you don't have to have any fancy little diffusers or anything else. Um, so Dude, this has just been absolutely fabulous. And <laughs> she has several books. I highly, highly recommend them. Um, the complete container herb gardening is one. And then the other one is the herb lover spa book, which I, I don't have, and I want to order. So, um, you can order those directly, right. Or get yes. them on Amazon, yes. um, but it's much better to go direct, <laughs> Um, with that, I want to thank you all for joining us today. I think we need another um, maybe <laughs> Herb Gardening 201 <laughs> class, yes. um, and we should do that soon. 